the hell is going on? What's really going on? We said, what the hell happened? You don't have to know what the hell is on it. They, they see what's going on. I don't know what's going on. What is going on? We must find out what is going on. Hi, I'm Danielle Pletka. And I'm Mark Thiessen. Welcome to our podcast, What the Hell is Going On? Mark, what the hell is going on? Well, we've got part two of our uh, podcast series this week on the uh, historic peace deals with uh, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and Israel and the United States. This is, as you've said, one of the most seismic events in the history of the Middle East. And maybe it's because of who brought it about and people who don't like him, or maybe it's because we've moved on to the fight over the Supreme Court and we're in the middle of an election, but this deserves a lot more attention than it's gotten. And so we've got the ambassadors of the UAE and Bahrain here today. Could you ever have imagined when we started this podcast that we'd have the ambassadors of Israel, UAE, and Bahrain with us on the podcast talking about peace? As I said in the interview with the Israeli ambassador as well, this is truly, it's a watershed, and it is a mark of a change in the Middle East that I don't think anyone would have predicted, and that the professional class of Middle East peace processors has never managed to achieve. So, you know, but I mean, Jared Kushner did. I know, you know, look, well, I said this, I said this to you earlier, you know, I think I was among those who was just sort of gobsmacked, you know, the president's son-in-law. What really, you know, I mean, what is this, the Kennedy administration? <laughs> you know, I really, I didn't have confidence in him and I didn't have confidence in his team. And I was wrong. And you know what? Everybody else was wrong too on this one. This Bahrain-UAE peace deal with Israel is something incredible. It is a testament to how much the Middle East has changed. It is a testament to how scared everybody was by Barack Obama's favoritism towards Iran. It is a testament to how scared everybody in the region is of what is happening in Iran and what is happening in Turkey. And it is, you know, it, it just opens all sorts of doors. It could be the beginning of a really great new era. I think it's also a testament to the value of having outsiders, a team B, take on a challenge that has eluded the experts for a long time. I mean, you know, everyone, you know, talked about how, you know, Jared Kushner said he would, he was reading 27 books on the Middle East, like learning about it, you know, and people... Yeah, made, that didn't sound good. And people made fun <laughs> of him about that. But he and the president didn't come in attached to all the conventions that have governed how we do business in the Middle East and how we pursue peace in the Middle East, both by Republicans and Democrats for decades. And, you know, the conventions were that you know, there's no separate peace. It has to go through Ramallah, that you can't move the U.S. embassy to uh, Jerusalem because that'll upset everything. You can't actually put sanctions on Iran and push back on Iran because that'll start a cataclysmic war. And the Trump administration came in and they were like, we didn't sign up to all these conventions. I understand that's how it was done, but we're going to do things differently. And they started breaking China and everybody set their hair on fire that this was going to inflame the region. And it did the exact opposite. Certain things just in government happen because that's always how it's been done. Yep. And some, it, sometimes it takes an outsider to come in and say, well, that's not how I'm doing it. And that's what happened here. So, you know, I said exactly what you just said when they moved the embassy, when the U.S. moved the embassy to Jerusalem. If we can just, uh, you know, go back in the way back machine, when the United States and the Trump administration finally decided to move the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, not to East Jerusalem, but disputed, but to West Jerusalem, you know, there was an absolute outcry, not so much from the Arab world, but, you know, from American aficionados of the peace process and of the left. And, you know, the predictions about about what would happen and that, you know, the Arab street would rise up. None of that was true. And so you are right. You know, a lot of the truisms, a lot of the conventions, a lot of the frozen thinking of people who are in my business, you know, the Middle East people, has really been upended. Not only that, but Another thing worth discussing is just the sort of gross partisanship that this has again revealed. You know what? I couldn't stand Barack Obama, 
But when he made some hard decisions on Afghanistan, I applauded him. And I applauded him because I thought it took courage to stand up to the people in his own party and to do the right thing. You know, no one, almost no one, is standing up courageously on the left and saying, this was an unbelievable accomplishment. Instead, I got asked, you know, isn't the United States really just bargaining away Israel's qualitative military edge and just buying the Emiratis by selling them F-35s? I'm sorry, what? You know, there's just so much garbage out there. Attacks on Israel, as I mentioned in the Dermer interview, attacks on Israel for not caring about democracy in the Arab world <laughs> and making peace with these two autocratic regimes, number one. And then number two, that the U.S. doesn't care about Israel's qualitative military edge because we're selling these advanced aircraft to to the Emirates. You know, this is just grasping at straws, trying to deny Trump and Jared Kushner the credit that they deserve for this. Well, good for you for not denying them the credit. But again, the partisanship, I mean, Nancy Pelosi called this a distraction. You know, a dis- seriously, literally Donald Trump can do nothing right, including, you know, the, the, it would have been a joke two years ago as Trump had come out and said, I could come out and have peace in the Middle East and they'd attack me. And we'd all laugh. Ha, ha, ha. He did come out and have peace in the Middle East and they still attack him. And here's the other thing that I want to get into with you uh, and I want to get into with our guests is that. Unlike the previous peace deals, so there are two previous peace deals, it, one with, with Egypt in 1979, one with Jordan in 1994. In both of those cases, there really wasn't a huge deepening of relations between the country, huge exchanges, true peace between the peoples. This strikes me as something that's going to be a lot more substantive and a lot more real, that there really is a desire on the part of these two Arab countries to deepen their relations and deepen people-to-people relations with the countries, deepen economic relations between the countries with Israel, which is something that was absent in previous accords. You said to me at one point that like the, the 1979 deal was really a fake deal. Talk about that. It was a deal that created peace between Israel and a country with which it had gone to war multiple times. And so in that sense, it was a breakthrough in the sense that it took a lot of courage for Sadat. Don't forget, Sadat not only signed the Camp David Accords, he then went to Israel. I mean, that was just something else. That's something even our, our friends uh, in the UAE and Bahrain have not done. Yeah. And and it, it was remarkable for its time. I don't want to take credit away from that either. But it involved a real quid pro quo, right? Israel gave back territory. Now, let's all note that Egypt didn't want Gaza back, even though... (laughs) But at the end of the day, it wasn't a real peace. And it was also a peace that has caused the United States in too many ways to look away at how the Egyptian government has behaved towards its own people. You know, our measure of a government shouldn't just be whether they make peace with Israel. It should also be the kind of government they are. We've given hundreds of billions of dollars to the Egyptian government, and they're an okay ally. They're in a very cold peace with Israel, but damn, these are not good. These are not democratic leaders. Amen. Well, let's turn to our guests uh, because we have the ambassadors of the UAE and Bahrain with us today. Ambassador Yusuf Otaiba is the ambassador of the United Arab Emirates to the United States. He's been in that job for 12 years now, and I know he's extremely well regarded in the diplomatic community. Prior to that, he was an advisor to uh, Mohammed bin Zayed al Nahyan, the, the crown prince in the UAE. Uh, he was 26 years old uh, when he was in charge of uh, security, anti terrorism, and defense liaison with other countries. <laughs> He's a, a force to be reckoned with. Ambassador Sheikh Abdullah bin Rashid al Khalifa is the ambassador of the Kingdom of Bahrain to the United States. Uh, he is a member of the royal family. He has been involved in diplomacy and in work in the royal court for many years. He was a governor, actually, in, in one of the governorates in Bahrain. And uh, and he has been engaged also in cooperation with the United States for many years, long before becoming ambassador. It's a real pleasure to have both of them. Here's our interview. Well, gentlemen, thank you uh, for joining us on the podcast. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Great. Well, let me start Pleasure with to be here. Let me start with Ambassador Otiba. These are the first Middle East peace deals in more than a quarter century, and not only one but two of them, which is un- unprecedented. How did this happen? How did we come to this great, great moment? 
Well, you uh, got a good deal, two for the price of one. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of things happened. You know, you said 26 years ago was the last peace agreement. A lot has happened in 26 years. The region has been changing. Attitudes have been changing. Mindsets have been changing. Young people are frustrated. They want to look forward, not backward. Everybody wants a solution to the Palestinian problem. Everybody wants to see a two-state solution. That hasn't changed. But people are looking for opportunities. People are looking for a better future. Had there been no annexation debate, maybe this would have happened in a year or five years or longer. We don't know. But the reason this happened now, at least in the case of the UAE, was because of annexation. Now, we've had these conversations for years and years. I think annexation would have made a lot of things more challenging. You've seen over the past few years more visible and overt cases where Israeli athletes or officials would come and, and visit or participate in competitions. You saw that there's going to be an Israeli pavilion and expo, which is now next year. All these things would have been much more challenging with annexation. And so we, we desperately tried to find a way to prevent annexation, and this was the solution we came up with. We're very proud because it ended up being a win-win. You know, in the UAE perspective, this is really what drove this decision, the mindset and the changing attitudes in the region, but also the potential impact of annexation. Let me turn to Ambassador Khalifa. And, you know, first, let me congratulate both of you and, and your leadership. You know, uh, I've said this to you both personally, but I think that people have not recognized just how much courage this step took, just how much leadership this step took. This is a, a seismic event in the Middle East, and I feel convinced these steps weren't taken lightly. So really, kudos to both your countries for doing this. Now, one of the things that I think is so interesting is that the context has also changed. Ambassador Otaiba talked about the annexation uh, being an impetus, but another thing that's changed is that you are looking to a new set of threats in the region. You know, an extremist uh, leadership in Iran, the threat of the Islamic Republic, and also the drift towards the Salafis of the Sunni leadership in Turkey. Uh, Ambassador Khalifa, how much of a factor was that? Well, I think that for us in Bahrain, we've been long advocates for an active participation in efforts to, to further stabilize the region, be it our hosting of the Peace to Prosperity Conference or tolerance of all religions within Bahrain. It's always been a part of who we are, our DNA. So this agreement just fits into that vision of His Majesty that he had for two decades now. And um, obviously, we will be facing a risk in the region, but to face it collectively will definitely deter the position of Iran. I think we have two things to look at. The internal issues that might arise from proxy activities and whatever happens in the region as well from external threats. It is one of the issues that uh, has been discussed, but when we weighed it with the positive outcomes of the uh, accords, it outweighs them. And uh, that's why I think Bahrain took a, a very quick step in uh, the same direction as the UAE to make sure that uh, both countries are moving in the same direction but we're also unlocking a lot of potential for the region, a lot of potential not only for us in Bahrain, but also for other parts of the region. This is a question for both of you, but uh, I'll start with Ambassador Otaiba. So what are the chances of this being not just peace, but a warm peace? Ambassador Michael Oren had a piece in the Wall Street Journal the other day where he talked about how in 1979 there was the peace deal with Egypt and there was a few months of tourism. And then after that, the anti-Israeli sentiment continued to grow and there really was never any deep engagement between Egypt and Israel. And similarly, in 1994 in Jordan, uh, there was brief engagement and then it's sort of gone downhill in terms of the relations between the countries at least between the populations. You're hoping for something better here, I think. Uh, why will this time be different? It's a really good question. And yes, I did read Michael's piece. Uh, it was remarkably accurate and insightful. I think there's a couple of differences between Jordan and Egypt's agreements with Israel versus UAE and Bahrain's. Egypt and Jordan came at the tail end, at the back end of wars. In the case of Egypt, there were territorial concessions. 
In the case of Jordan, it came right in on the tail end or the beginning, sorry, of, of the Oslo Accords. And so it wrestled with much more challenging issues. I grew up in Egypt. I was born and raised in Egypt. And, and most Egyptians, like myself, grew up thinking Israel is the enemy. You just you grow up with that programmed in your head. It's not something you learn. It's something you accept as a reality. So in the case of the UAE and Bahrain, it's very different. We've never had a war with Israel. Most of our populations were not alive to witness the 1973 or 67 wars. They don't see that part of history. We don't share borders, so we don't discuss you know, controversial issues like refugees and borders on the Palestinian issues. So we don't have a lot of that sort of baggage in our agreements. And so not only do I know it's going to be a war and peace, I already see it. You know, in the five weeks since the announcement was made, we've had MOUs on COVID research, on AI, on self-driving vehicles between a, two private sector companies yesterday. About a week ago, there was an announcement on a joint film festival between the UAE and Israel. So there's a lot of interest in exploring opportunities that are going to be mutually beneficial, whether it's on the cultural, on the business side. I just think there's a lot of hope. I think people in the UAE want to get to know people in Israel, and people in Israel want to get to know people in the UAE without the history. Ambassador Khalifa, the same question for you, but one more point from Michael's op-ed. He said one of the reasons for the failure to have a warm peace in the previous accords was a refusal to recognize the Jewish people as indigenous to the Middle East. And Bahrain's foreign minister said that Israel is part of the heritage of the region, which is a, a bold statement about Israel. Do you feel that that's part of the key to making this peace agreement work? I don't want to answer for Ambassador Khalifa, but you know, one of the first Jewish ambassadors from an Arab state, if correct me, Ambassador Khalifa, if I'm wrong, was the Bahraini ambassador to the United States. Am I right? Am I remembering correctly? That's absolutely correct. And um, not only was she posted as the first Arab ambassador, a woman ambassador, but also she came from the uh, Shura Council, which is a consultative council where she served as appointed by His Majesty. So she had a lucrative professional career. She came into Washington. We do have an indigenous Jewish society in Bahrain. So it just it was very important for them as well. But as we speak today, entering it with much enthusiasm from both sides, our governments have already gone to work. Uh, both countries have established working groups in different areas and uh, we're in the process of creating a framework Maybe it's very similar to the UAE, by which we will collaborate on identifying and implementing shared initiatives. Now, yeah. trade, tourism, direct flight are all given. But uh, like Zexon's Ambassador Ateba stated, there are other fields of cooperation like energy, healthcare, technology. And I think those areas will instill hope, will open and unlock opportunities for both our people. And we do look forward to working with one another. Now, as we go forward, I think that there will undoubtedly be hurdles along the way. And that's why it's, it's going to be very important for us to work closer together to harness that enthusiasm with which our nations have entered these agreements. By the way, uh, Ambassador Hudanunu is not just a dear friend. We came to Washington together in the summer of 2008. We served together for a few years. And she was uh, in town for the signing last week. And it was really, really nice to see her again. Let me ask both of you, and I'll, this is a difficult question, so I'll let you two argue about who's going to answer it. You know, for me, as, a, as, as someone who grew up and studied the Middle East, there was uh, almost a truism in Middle East policy and in Middle East studies that the road to peace was going to always go through Ramallah or, or Jerusalem, if you wanted to argue that, that in short, without a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian problem, that there could never be peace. And for a whole variety of reasons, some of which we've discussed, that has changed. I wrote a piece earlier this week in which I sort of laid out why I think the Palestinians have in part played a role in ensuring that the road no longer goes through them, that they've missed a lot of opportunities to move forward. The Palestinian current chairman of the Arab League stepped down from his position as chairman of the Arab League in protest against this Abraham Accords. Why this sorry history? And why has the region in some ways needed to move on without progress on this other front? So let, let me take first crack at this. 
I'm a big fan of the Arab Peace Initiative. The Arab Peace Initiative was brilliant. It was simple, straightforward, and I thought it was very fair. It was launched almost 20 years ago, 18 years ago to be exact. Nobody on this call can point to any tangible progress that the peace, Arab Peace Initiative had actually mustered in 18 years. We are exactly the same place where it was launched in 2002. And so I would respond by simply saying, would you like us to wait another 18 years with no progress before we try a different approach? Clearly, even though it's a brilliant idea and it's fair and most people supported it, it still didn't solve the issue. So we don't have a solution. Maybe this provides another alternative way of thinking of the issue. Maybe it doesn't. We don't know. But had we not done what we did, had we not negotiated what we did, we would be discussing on this podcast today how much annexation was going to harm Israel and the region. We would be discussing whether annexation was supposed to be 10, 20, or 30% of the territories. So it's important to put things in perspective. And we've had this debate. Look, this may or may not have happened with minus the annexation debate. But the truth is, we actually preserved the two-state solution. We bought time and space. Now, how that time and space gets utilized, that's ultimately up to the players, not, not to us. Ambassador Khalifa, the Palestinians accused both your leadership and, uh, and the leadership in the UAE of betraying them. Fair? Uh, I think that uh, our foreign minister was very clear, our message was very clear. We've demonstrated our support to the Palestinian people time and time again. We do believe that the establishment of relations with Israel does not undermine our commitment to the two-stage solution. It was part of what the foreign minister stated last week at the event. And uh, in fact, we believe that interaction rather than exclusion will help get us closer to the realization of that goal by incentivizing both sides to seriously engage in negotiations. So let's hope that the ball will start rolling with a fresh approach to this uh, ongoing issue. And normalization doesn't mean we ignore the two-state solution. Look, there's Jordan and Egypt have a relationship with Israel. They still support the two-state solution, as will we. You know, it's not a blank check. But I also think, you know, Danny, you mentioned the Arab League meeting. I think it was really important to also highlight what happened in the meeting. There was a demand by the Palestinian Authority, the chair of the meeting, to insert language condemning the normalization moves. Do you know how many countries supported inserting that language? Nope. Zero. Zero. Not one single country backed adopting condemnation language in the, in the meeting. Not one. Wow. wow. And I, I think it's just important to note, like your first question was, how did we get here? This is September 2020. Things are changing. The attitudes are changing. Palestinian issue is very important. Two-state solution is very important. But not one single country backed the Palestinians when they asked for condemnation language to be inserted in the statement. I think that's important to note. When we were talking earlier about why this will reduce a warm peace versus a cold peace, the reason we all agreed was that both of your countries have recognized the Jewish people as indigenous to the region, and obviously you've recognized the right of Israel to exist. Is the reason why you have succeeded while the Palestinians have failed to reach a two-state solution, is their refusal to do the same thing, uh, essentially? This is just the fundamental principle that allows peace to go forward. The Palestinian leadership doesn't really recognize Israel's right to exist. Is that the impediment? And can that change? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I mean, I think there's a lot of tension in the Palestinian leadership, right? There's two sides of this coin between Fatah and Hamas that are, you know, have not reconciled. Uh, a few days ago, I saw news that there's going to be plans for a vote for the first time, I think, since 2006 throughout the different territories. So that's, that's a positive step. So I think if the Palestinian factions can reconcile on what their position is, on what their view is, on how they're going to deal with this issue, unlikely that we make progress until there's some kind of consensus within the Palestinian factions. Whether that happens or not, that's totally up to them. But yeah, that, that's one of the questions they have to wrestle with. But it's hard for us to, I think, kind of judge on whether that's what they should or shouldn't do. They, they need to come to that conclusion themselves. 
So let's talk a little bit about the region. The United States has been in the region willingly and unwillingly now every decade going back for a conflict, whether relating to the aftermath of 9-11 or to other challenges that Iran has posed. One of the things that I wonder looking forward is whether Israel can actually play a role in the collective defense of the Mediterranean against what I think we can all agree is a very serious and growing Iranian threat. I mean, you know, in the wake of the Iran deal, we saw Iran escalating in Bahrain. We saw Iran seeking to destabilize a number of Gulf states. We saw the the challenge of the Houthis, not to speak of the Hashda Sherbi, their popular mobilization units in Iraq and Hezbollah. We could go on for quite a while about the bad things that Iran is, is up to. Can Israel play a role in helping defend U.S. allies? I don't know. I think, honestly, I think it's too early to tell, you know, how engaged uh, or not engaged the Israelis are at this point. I don't know. I can't speak for them. Uh, We haven't had that conversation as far as I know. The conversations that we've been having with Israel, like Ambassador Khalifa has said, has been mostly on opportunities, trade, investment, civil aviation, technology, uh, COVID, things like that. So we're trying to create these opportunities for our young people who want better futures and better jobs. We haven't really tackled the geopolitics and the national security elements yet. I suspect if both sides are willing to have a cooperative relationship on these types of issues, I'm sure it will be met well received. But I don't think, as far as the UAE is concerned, I don't believe we've had that conversation yet. So let me ask you a question. When Anwar Sadat made peace with Israel, he paid for it with his life. The Salafi jihadis of the day assassinated him. Are you worried about blowback from the Salafi jihadi movement and also from the Shia extremist movement? That challenge was obviously on the table when the issue was discussed. And uh, the dynamics are shifting very quickly. The challenges seem to be more or less the same. I think with time, we have been able to mitigate the threats that were coming from extremist ideologies within the country. Education was very important. We uh, tried to reach out to different sectors within the community to make sure that the social fabric of the community is protected. This deal was a very optimistic and hopeful deal. A lot of the Bahrainis understand that, and that's why... You see, those that have been outspoken in the past couple of days are those that are related one way or another to these external parties. And um, the majority of people are starting to understand it. We don't see an an issue with it going forward. But for us, it was a, a sovereign decision and a step forward that will benefit our people and the region as a whole. We don't need to theorize on this. Uh, the Iranians came out and publicly said that the UAE is now a legitimate target right after we announced normalization with Israel. So this is not, we don't need to debate it. They've said it. Just anecdotally, here in the U.S., in our embassy, after the announcement, our cyber team came and briefed me and said the attempts to hack and uh, penetrate systems here in the embassy have basically just multiplied. The number of people trying to get in, harm, or attack us, whether here in the embassy or in the UAE, I think definitely significantly increased. We know this. I think most folks here in the national security world know this. But it was something we anticipated. It wasn't wasn't a shocking uh, discovery. Of course, whenever you embed further in sort of the U.S. camp, you know, there are some people who are going to continue to target you even more. So for me, exit question. It's not a revolution. It's an evolution. But it's a real change in the dynamics of the Middle East The president of the United States has said that he's talking to other countries about uh, ending the state of conflict with Israel and new peace agreements. Do you think we're going to see, I'm not going to put you on the spot uh, and say who, but do you think we're going to see additional such accords in the coming months? I know there's a lot of efforts with several countries in various stages, so I can't speak to, you know, how likely it is to happen next week or next month. That's ultimately up to that country. They have to decide based on their own sort of interests, their own judgment, their own public opinion, and so on. So is there an effort with multiple countries? Yes. How close or how far? I I think it's not my place to uh, comment, but, you know, it's a perfect subject for 
a few other ambassadors maybe in the next in your next podcast. <laughs> Mark, Mark, just FYI, this is what's called diplomacy. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm I'm learning. Three. I'm I'm here with three diplomats. I can. I can... <laughs> I think Mark got an exit question, too. My exit question mm-hmm. is, as the uh, in-house Trump defender, talk a little bit about the role that Jared Kushner played in this. Because when the news came that President Trump had appointed Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, as in charge of peace in the Middle East, it was met with a lot of derision in Washington. And like, oh, the, you know, he doesn't know anything about the history of the Middle East. He's not steeped in, in all the conventions. He doesn't know this stuff. He, he's never going to be able to achieve Middle East peace. And well, all of a sudden, we've got two peace deals within 29 days of each other. And he seems to have helped usher in something that has eluded the entire Middle East expert class in Washington. Uh, is that fair? And, and what kind of role did he play? So it's very fair. And in, and in our case, not just Jared, but Jared and his team were instrumental. Most of our negotiations were done, at least in my situation, was with Avi Berkowitz and General Miguel Correa in the NSC. In the span of the four or five weeks, I've probably spoken to each one of them multiple times per day, meetings in the White House, meetings at our house, meetings everywhere. But really, between the three of them, they got this done. And just to put a note on it, it's important to recognize that most of these negotiations were all done in the span of really like five weeks. This was probably one of the fastest deals negotiated and completed that I've ever witnessed. We basically understood what we both wanted. It was a very simple and a very logical transaction. It was normalization in exchange for no annexation. And I just want to give credit where credit's due. It was really Jared and Avi and Miguel who managed to pull this off in record time. just want to second what uh, Ambassador Ateba stated. Uh, maybe our deal was a, a little bit faster because of the timing. It had to be done in time for the ceremony. The same team, they worked with us here. They worked with folks back home. And we were just happy to wrap it up in time and now take it forward with the same people to make sure that we are also seeing uh, similar agreements to what the UAE had put out. Fantastic. Well, speaking for myself, I can't wait to fly from here to Dubai to Bahrain to Tel Aviv. That's just going to be incredible. So, you know, to really to both of you, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for this amazing work. Uh, We're really grateful that you were able to talk to us. Thank you. Okay, Danny. So Barack Obama got the Nobel Peace Prize for doing nothing. (laughs) Does Donald Trump or Jared Kushner deserve a Nobel Peace Prize for this? Honestly, I think it's an insult to to say that anybody deserves the Nobel Peace Prize, given who's received it over recent years. <laughs> so I, I'm not going to touch that one. the The things that I think, the things that I think we, you and I, didn't talk about are a the Palestinians and b who's next. Mm-hmm. So the word on who's next is Oman, mm-hmm. Sudan, and after that, I don't know. I think we potentially could see others. Well, there's some interesting reporting about uh, tensions within Saudi, that the king wasn't told about this before it actually happened and uh, was none too pleased that MBS would actually like to do this and that it's the king that is resistant. And the king gave a speech to the UN General Assembly, didn't mention this deal. So, you know... Did he mention Palestine? I didn't read his speech. I don't know if he mentioned Palestine. I just saw that he he didn't mention the deal made by Bahrain and, and UAE. So I think that's... It, there's interesting internal dynamics and generational dynamics going on in Saudi. But look, peace begets peace. It would not be surprising at all uh, if this set off a, uh, a chain reaction in the coming months. And then that throws the ball into the court of the Palestinians, because the root of the reason why there is not a two-state solution today is because their their refusal to accept Israel as a legitimate Middle Eastern country, whose people are legitimate, its existence is legitimate, and the existence of a Jewish state. And we now have four Arab countries that have done this, and it's up to the Palestinians to decide. They no longer have the entire peace process in the broader Middle East in their control. And so they have to decide whether they're willing to do the same thing that UAE and Bahrain did or not. Well, you know, when the Palestinians 
established the Palestinian Authority in 1993, they actually accepted the right of Israel to live in peace and security. But that was just the one faction. That was Fatah. And the mm-hmm. problem is we've also got Iranian-backed Hamas that governs Gaza. And, you know, obviously what happened in 1993 was not followed by a sustained track towards peace. The problem for the Palestinians is that they're mired in history. They're always looking backwards. They're living in in a Middle East that hasn't existed since, you know, 1980 and won't exist again. And history is passing them by. You know, I don't care about Mahmoud Abbas, uh, the president for life of the Palestinian Authority. I care actually about the, the well-being of the Palestinian people. And they have been screwed up one side and down another by their own self-appointed representatives, whether it's the PLO or Fatah, as the leadership of the PLO is called, or Hamas, or, you know, the Iranian-run Hezbollah. None of these people actually care about Palestinians. None of these people actually care about Palestine. All they care about is the conflicts that they can continue in order to sustain themselves. And, you know, that's all the more reason why the UAE and Bahrain were courageous in kind of saying, you know, yeah, we support a two-state solution. We want what's right for the Palestinians. But, you know, if they don't want to move on with their lives, are we meant to be trapped forever? That's what Yusuf al said. And that ought to be a wake-up call to them. The fact that it hasn't been is just a tragedy. So one other shift in policy that I think contributed to a lot of this, you know, Donald Trump gets a lot of uh, grief for being so tough on the NATO allies and that he's not as committed to NATO as you and I would like him to be, which is true. But one of the things Barack Obama did was pivot towards Iran and and really weaken our alliances with countries like the UAE, like Saudi Arabia and other countries. And he, you know, he gets a pass on that. But it was really Trump's commitment to restoring and reviving those alliances that in many ways made this possible. So, you know, Donald Trump, the alliance breaker, maybe so in Europe, maybe that he has a blind spot when it comes to Russia. But in the Middle East, he has shored up our alliances. And that gave these countries the confidence to go ahead and do this. Well, maybe too much confidence in the case of Saudi Arabia. But uh, look, what you're saying is right. You know, the reality is that Barack Obama could have done this as, as well. After he signed the disastrous Iran deal, he said that he recognized that it would lead Iran to feel empowered in the region and that we were going to have to work with our allies and friends to push back. Right? But he didn't. That's one of the reasons why everybody forgets this, why the United States started supporting Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen, was for this notional idea of balance. But that wasn't what was necessary. What was necessary was to actually stop Iran from trying to take over the rest of the region. And instead, the Obama administration just sat there and sort of said, "Eh, well, you know, And, and I remember the infamous quote, Saudi Arabia and Iran will just have to learn to share the region. Hell to the no. I don't want to share the region between Saudi Arabia and Iran. No way. You know, these are legitimate countries that have their legitimate interests, and they don't want to be governed from Riyadh or Tehran. So, you know, kudos to them for waking up and recognizing that the United States isn't always going to be in the right place and that they need to make their own alliances and their own friendships in order to stand up for their shared interests. Well, we're going to take up these ambassadors and their offer to come back in six months and see how this is going. And what will be interesting to me is see, we know there's going to be a lot of economic cooperation. We know there's going to be a lot of cultural cooperation. It'll be fascinating to see how much military and security cooperation results from this because Israel is going to be a bulwark against Iran. And I think these countries recognize that and that that's going to be critical to the the future peace of the Middle East. Well, I like talking about peace. I like talking (laughs) about good stuff. It's, It's so rare on this podcast. You know where to send your complaints. You can send all the flattery to me. Problems with the technology, that's Alexa's fault. (laughs) Thanks for listening. Alexa, fix this. (laughs) Thanks for listening. We'll see you soon. And our team here at AEI is Alexa Santry, Matt Winesett, Jen Moretta, and Macy Heath. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at AEI.org. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D. Pletka. And I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C. Please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 